passengers the need of a ride with nearby drivers. Formally, today, I know in Nevada law, uh, we are applying as a transportation network company in the state of Nevada. Lyft launched in June of 2012 and is now in more than 55 cities across the United States. Uh, Lyft launched with a vision of making carpooling mainstream, of changing the way we use our automobiles and incentivizing people to fill up the empty seats in the car and share rides. In order to match drivers and riders, Lyft uses GPS location and third-party mapping software to match to create a match. All activity on the platform is logged, including trip information, driver and passenger performance and information, um, and it's all tracked to ensure safety of users at all times. Payment is completed using a third-party payment processor, using a credit card or debit card entered into the application. The payment experience is seamless and requires no exchange of cash. In terms of a customer experience and what Nevadans will experience um, with Lyft, customers will be able to easily download the app onto their smartphone and then are able to request a ride with just the tap of the button. Once the customer requests a ride within the application, um, then it begins using GPS as well in order to create the match. Uh, at the moment that a driver and passenger are matched, uh, then certain information is moved to the passenger so they know exactly who and where that person is going to be picking them up from. The customer will receive a photo of the car, uh, the license plate information of the car that's coming to pick them up, a photo of the driver, as well as a map indicating what direction the driver is coming from. Um, they also will see the, the driver ranking at that time. Uh, at that point, a friendly Lyft driver will come and pick up the passenger within a few minutes and take the passenger to their desired location. There is uh, an, an anonymous voice and text connection at that moment if there's any uh, conversation that has to occur between the driver and rider. Um, once the ride then ends, the passenger is automatically sent a receipt via email that indicates the following. The date and time of the ride, the name and the photo of the driver, the pickup and drop off location, the rate and any calculation of rate that was paid, any tip, if any, that was given to the driver by the passenger, what card was charged in terms of what credit or debit charge. You can still add a tip at this point um, and any lost account information, zero cards and information, information about our 24-hour, seven-day week trust and safety team, and an ability to request a price review. At that point, a passenger is uh, required to rate the driver, or prompted to rate the driver. We use a five-star system with five being the highest marks. If a passenger gives anything less than five stars to the driver, um, there's a prompt within the app that talks about how the ride could be improved, whether it's safety, cleanliness, navigation, or friendliness. And if a passenger or a driver ever get the other below three stars, uh, they will never be matched again. In terms of drivers, uh, Ms. K, Kelly K, will be giving a in-depth um, sort of discussion about the onboarding process and what we do and how we are compliant with the NTA rules and AB 176. I just want to talk briefly before I finish about who are Lyft drivers. Uh, Lyft drivers are diverse. 32% of our drivers are women, 50% identifying themselves with minority groups. Lyft drivers are experienced. 92% of our drivers are at least 25 years old. Uh, Lyft drivers drive part-time. The vast majority uh, drive for Lyft and, and we hear from them. It is for their flexibility and to supplement their income. 96% uh, of drivers either have full-time jobs, part-time jobs, or seeking employment, or are students. 78% of our drivers drive less than 15 hours a week, with over half driving for less than five hours a week. These are small business owners, teachers, people in creative professions, people from all walks of life, and here they are Nevadans. They are local members of the community. Uh, and with that, I will just thank you and turn it over to Ms. King. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, Ms. Babcock, thank you for your help so far. Um, I'm here to actually walk you through the application information that's provided as well as some additional um, compliance elements with regards to AB 176 and the regulations that were passed on Friday. Um, the application itself um, followed the, the outline of the emergency regulations and did not ask for a lot of detail as to how we were complying with the original sections um, of the law. So I think a lot of Ms. Fleshman's concerns will be answered through this process now. So um, I'll walk through those to make sure that we have the, the answers for you guys. And if I miss anything, feel free to ask me. Um, so I was going to start with section 19. And again, if this becomes too much for folks, um, we can uh, skip over things. But I'll talk high level about things. Um, so first is the submission of driver lists, is, is what I would like to call it. So I've submitted an initial list of drivers to the MTA. 
um, with the cover email regarding compliance with AB 176, um, sections 29 and 31 with regards to vehicles and the driver um, process for onboarding. Um, I've also created a new sample compliance um, attestation to hand out to the commissioners um, that I would use in the future, which would be attached to each driver list that would be submitted, and also a sample of the driver list format um, for the commissioners to review as well, which will go through the running total of drivers that Lyft submits, the current list of drivers who meet the requirements of AB 176, um, a list of any changes to driver information, so should a driver move, should they have a driver's license, should they change vehicles, we would include any changes to that information in that report as well. And then finally, any off-boarded drivers to comply with the requirements notified me within 10 days of the drivers that we um, deactivated in the system. Um, so that report, I also have a sample of that I can circulate in paper format, and I don't know what the process should be that, or I'm not sure you And at the end of the hearing today, I'll provide another electronic version of the driver list with the permit numbers associated with them and the attestation in regards to that list. Uh, copies of these will be provided to Chairman McKay. Commissioner, I don't, I don't have them. Um, I'll use my imagination to follow along. I think I got an idea of what they are, though. And the internet is actually dummy data, so it's not actual data. It's so what that actually means is that every driver that's on that list has gone through our onboarding process, which I'll walk you through, and that every vehicle on that list has also gone through the inspection process and has a detail assigned to it. Um, so as part of the application process, I submitted screenshots that show the, the flow, the application flow of all of the drivers. So they can either do this online or through a mobile <coughs> application. Um, mm -hmm. In the application process, we collect name, date of birth, address, social security number, driver's license number, and all the vehicle details, including make, model, and year of the vehicle. Um, all drivers on the platform must be over 23 years old, so though the law requires 19 years old in Nevada, our policy is 23 years old. Um, the reference Ms. Washington makes to 18 years old is with regards to passengers. We don't um, allow unaccompanied minors in our system, so our terms of use limits um, people who are passengers in our system to being over the age of 18. So drivers must be above 23. Um, on average, as Mr. Burr said, our drivers are 25 years old. Um, the vehicle age is also another item that's been brought up in the past. Um, for Nevada, we've adopted a policy of a vehicle being um, no older than eight years old. Um, currently, we're, our policy in other states is actually 12 years, but we decided to take a, a stricter stance here in Nevada and go with an eight-year limitation. Most of the vehicles that have been onboarded so far are younger than five years old, so that's again another policy that we've just taken in turn with. Um, in the event that a driver provides a driver's license that has only been issued for a year or less, we actually require the driver to provide us with an additional driver's license number from the previous state they were in. So if someone had moved, um, we want to make sure we get enough driving history. Based upon that information that's submitted, we run the first check, which is the motor vehicle records, or sorry, the, the driver records check. So that's through a company called American Driving Records. Um, we submit them with all the personal information of the driver. They run a check on, based upon the driver's license numbers that were provided in the name, and they come back with the results for us. So we receive a motor vehicle records report um, that is uploaded into our system, um, and that is put into the driver's profile in our system, for lack of a better explanation. Um, that's accessible all the time. I think in the staff report it said um, it was re um, removed after two weeks. It's only the background check that's removed after two weeks, so I wanted to clarify that. Um, so the driving records are actually there for them all the time. In addition, we receive an automatic feed um, that kind of breaks it into technology, for lack of a better term, that goes into a matrix that we have that covers all 50 states with the requirements with regards to the, the, what are disqualification items from a driving records perspective. So in the case of Nevada, it's looking for the incidents in the past three years. So three in incidents in the past three years, or the single incident that might be a gross misdemeanor or a felony. So if any of those appear in the driver's record, they go through this matrix and the driver would be disqualified. 
um, what disqualification means if they're receiving notice, an SCRA notice, Fair Credit Reporting Act notice, that they have, we've taken adverse action based upon information that we pulled from American driving records. Um, then they're no longer eligible to continue through the process to become a driver. If they pass, they're actually set up with a mentor um, and an inspection time. So then they go to our facility here in Nevada, which is a currently temporary facility, to have their vehicles inspected. At the inspection facility, a bunch of employees actually perform the inspection. The facility has been trained to perform the inspection. Um, they go through a training session with the driver on how to deal with drivers, about safety, um, about the rules that are particular to Nevada itself. So they actually sit down and get a training session. Um, they go through the 19-point vehicle inspection. It's all done and uh, monitored through the application itself. So again, they upload the vehicle to the driver profile with the vehicle and through the inspection, passing inspection. Um, at that point, the, this employee or mentor will drive with the, the potential driver to ensure that they can use a navigation system, that they're safe drivers, that anything that has to be tested while the vehicle is in motion is being tested. If they get through that process and the vehicle and the driver both pass, um, we'll move on to the next phase, which is the background check process. Um, in the background check process, we take the name and social security number and the address, and we plug it into a company called Sterling Fact Check. Um, Sterling Fact Check is a company that's been around since 1975. They perform over 15 million background checks per year. They have 23,000 um, customers of their services right now. Um, they're professional background check providers and also certified. Um, through Sterling, um, they actually go through multiple databases to determine whether or not a driver hits any of the criteria that are set forth in the E-176. So the database, first there's a social security number trace. So we take the social security number of the driver, we trace that through the system to determine any information <coughs> or any addresses that are associated with that social security number. So that includes looking at magazine subscriptions, credit reports, any previously known addresses associated with that social security number. Based upon that, they create a list of the county databases that should be searched with regards to that driver. That's to look for criminal activity in places where that driver might have been. Search. An arrest direct search actually goes through 3,500 jurisdictions for bookings and incarcerations. It covers about 70% 70, 70 of the incarcerations in the population. Um, based upon any results that come up, again, they would go into the county facts to see exactly what the county has that so in those counties where they don't have the direct connection through technology um, there's actually court or runners that go out physical people go to the courthouses with the name and information of the driver and look for any anything in the history of the, of the past seven years for that driver even if it is a paper-based record um, so that would be done on the county records on those um, paper-based records um, we also check in Nevada specifically for any criminal activity to the Nevada state database that's out there um, and Um, since the overall process 
you'll see that this potential driver was actually arrested for a misdemeanor, but the case was closed and it was dismissed. So as a result, this driver wouldn't have hit any red flags in the system, um, but we would have received a notice from Sterling saying there's something on this record that you should look at. So then our trust and safety team is able to look at the information that comes back on the report and make a determination whether it's something that we should disqualify them for or not. In it, and these reports are retained by the company? So we receive them and they stay in the system for two weeks while we're doing the disposition of an application and then they're deleted automatically from our system. However, we have access for seven years into the Sterling database to actually access them. So like logging into your online bank account, we have trust and safety team members who can log into the Sterling system with the driver's name and just pull up the actual, the actual one that we were provided that they were required to store by law in our database and we can pull it down and download it if we need to um, just review it if we need to or anything else. So that's always available to us, but for security reasons, we just don't want to keep live social security numbers in our system. Okay, and uh, who reviews this back background report on your city? Um, it's the trust and safety team. Or the Pardon me? Trust and safety or compliance. Okay, and uh, are those individuals located here in Nevada or are they in San Francisco? They're in San Francisco. Okay. And in addition to that, we also have an automated process. So when the information comes through um, through an API, which is basically just the raw data of the background check, it gets fed into our system with another matrix, again, that takes So the Sterling back check, the company that we use, actually does both fingerprint-based checks and the social security number-based checks. Um, and we've worked with their compliance team to see what the best solution is, and they highly recommend the name-based social security number-based check. And they do so for a couple of reasons. Um, 
Number one is the accuracy of the data that's provided. So because these are considered SCRA checks, there's actually a due process that's built into them. So they're paid to be accurate, basically, versus the FBI databases, which are voluntary for people to input information into. They're actually not fully dispositioned in all cases, so people could be disqualified based upon information that isn't complete or accurate. They're also not timely, so those are six or seven months behind in a lot of cases from the fingerprinting perspective, whereas these databases are real-time. The checks that are being done are real-time and up-to-date. So if I committed a crime last week, it's more likely to be found in this type of background check than a fingerprint-based background check. So my question is, one shouldn't necessarily preclude the use of the other. I think you have to acknowledge that there are some holes in this type of system that are captured by a fingerprint-based system, and that's basically false identity, utilizing the identity of somebody else, which is captured and clearly remedied by a fingerprint system. So again, just because you use one, it doesn't completely preclude you from using the other. And again, I'm just wondering why that type of business is business that doesn't have to be used. Thank you. 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 Thank
I should say just as a whole. Um, obviously, you do the, the vehicle inspection and the training to make sure he or she's capable of, of driving for you. Do you have an idea in terms of percentage of that attempt to want to drive for Lyft and then don't make it through due to either a background issue relative to uh, the criminal end and or the when they meet with a mentor and so on and so forth? And I'll ask that same question for Uber. Sure. Um, currently for Nevada, we've actually been tracking this. Um, and the team on the ground here tells me that one in five make it through the process. One in five? Mm -hmm. So we're being pretty discriminatory. <laughs> the one, ones that are excluded, and again, I, I would trust that we have to look at the report and see why, why they are in fact excluded. It gives us kind of a, a general idea as to what is kicking them out. Is it more of a driving record or is it a criminal history? My understanding is it's, and it, it's always generally been based on a driving record. I think that's what dings the most people, although I don't have any hard information about 